party to the webinar of today. Uh, so the webinar of today is, entitled, is titled uh, Fast and Efficient uh, Underwater Propulsion Inspired by Biology. The speaker is uh, uh, Professor Alexander J. Smith. And uh, let me quickly introduce him and then I leave him the stage uh, for, for, his, uh, for his seminar. So um, Alexander J. Smith is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, fellow of uh, uh, American Academy of Arts and Science, honorary fellow uh, of the Royal uh, um, Aeronautical Society, fellow of the American Physical Society and the American Institute of Aeronautics and uh, Astronautics. Uh, the, of the American uh, Society of Mechanical Engineers and of the Australian Fluid Mechanics uh, Society, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is uh, author, together with uh, J.P. Uh, Dussoge, uh, of uh, Turbulent Shear Layers in uh, Compressible Flows, uh, published by Springer, and author of uh, Physical Introduction to Fluid Mechanics, uh, and editor of flow visualization techniques and examples uh, edited by press by um, uh, Imperial College Press, as well as author and co-author of more than 450 journal articles and papers in uh, conference proceedings. Uh, he holds patents and uh, testing the on testing the aerodynamics uh, of golf balls and uh, on using uh, femtoseconds lasers in uh, eye surgery and tattoo removal. Uh, his awards include uh, the Utah Bachelor Prize in Fluid Mechanics, the APS Fluid Dynamics Prize, uh, the IAAA uh, Aerodynamics Measurement Technology Award, and the Honorary uh, Doctorate of uh, Engineering from the uh, University of Melbourne, uh, Australia, the Medaille de la Ville de Marseille, and uh, the ASME Fluid uh, Engineering Awards, the IAAA uh, uh, ben Benfendry uh, Aerospace Literature Award, the President's Awards for Distinguished Teaching uh, from Princeton University, uh, IAAA uh, Fluid Dynamics Awards. He was also Chair uh, of the Division of Fluid Dynamics uh, of APS and Editor-in-Chief of the IAAA uh, Journal. So it is a great pleasure that I, it is with great pleasure that I introduce uh, uh, Alexander J. Smith. Uh, Alex, I give you the stage. Thank you, Francesca. Um, let me uh, do that. Okay. Um, so thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me to um, to give uh, this talk. Um, it's um, it's a, a really interesting area that I've been interested in in some time, and uh, I wanted to share at least some of the ideas and thoughts that we've had recently. And, uh, you know, it's been a work with lots of people, uh, and I've just mentioned a few of them here, um, but it's been ongoing with a, a, a large cast of characters, and it's been a, a really fun thing to do. So, and, and I'm very happy to share it. And, and uh, all, mo uh, yes, almost all of this funding uh, was funded by through the Office of Naval Research in one form or another, uh, with a little bit of funding from NSF along the way. Um, so if um, yeah, motivation is, um, is largely to do with um, bio-inspired underwater propulsion. The, the, I, I interrupt you just a second. You're, uh, you may need to reshare your screen. Ah, okay. Um, I, let me do that again. Um, Uh, yeah, we, we see it now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, but you don't see the full screen, right? We don't see the full screen. We see the presentation, the, the, the PowerPoint framework. Uh, yeah. You can uh, start the presentation mode. It will take uh, a few seconds. So I, I notify as, uh, you as soon as we see the presentation mode. Yeah, we see it. We see it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, oh. Okay, um, let me go back up if I can. Um, here we go. Um, so 
we've been talking about uh, underwater vehicles and um, there, there are a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of uh, underwater vehicles available and some are, are very uh, efficient, uh, such as these gliders that go up and down in the ocean to sample uh, salinity profiles or, or temperature profiles and so on, uh, but they're not very maneuverable. They're quite efficient, but they're not maneuverable. And then, of course, you have the sort of thing that can go down to uh, look at the Titanic, um, which are, you know, camera platforms, essentially, uh, highly maneuverable, um, but, of course, very poor hydrodynamics. Uh, so they're not very efficient. And so there's a kind of a, a niche there where we're looking for a, a new generation of underwater vehicles that are both maneuverable uh, and efficient and uh, therefore they can go long distances. And of course, we're going to look at nature to get that kind of inspiration. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the, the sort of left-hand side and the right-hand side. Um, there's on the, on the one side, um, uh, fish like manta rays, who uh, also uh, migrate over long distances and apparently uh, quite uh, efficient um, and highly maneuverable, of course. And then we have on the right hand side, uh, we have a class of uh, fish that are uh, known for their high speed as well as efficiency because they also migrate over long distances. And so you have this, um, these different parts of nature giving you inspiration for possible vehicles. And um, I'm going to start out by talking about um, fish like tuna, mackerel, uh, which are um, rather stiff fish. Um, and uh, they are uh, characterized by a, um, a, a flapping motion of their uh, tail. And in particular, uh, the propulsion due to the caudal fin, uh, which is the lunate fin at the uh, tail of the, uh, of the fish shown here. And you can see them swimming around. Um, they are very, uh, they can be very fast swimmers. They, as I said, they migrate over long distances. And uh, because of their, uh, their uh, ability to uh, move very quickly when required, this is uh, a, a new inspiration for underwater vehicle design. And uh, we're really interested in building some uh, models for this, some ideas about how to um, do some analytical work uh, and some uh, uh, experimental work in the lab. And so we look at this uh, uh, a fish like a tuna and note that uh, really uh, most of the thrust is produced by the caudal fin, at least uh, as far as we can tell, we've, we've, we've been looking at these kinds of um, uh, force distributions uh, for some time now, and it seems a reasonable assumption that at least uh, the majority of the thrust comes from the caudal fin. And then there's a the drag that's produced by the body, and there's also some drag that's produced by the caudal fin itself. And so um, that combination between the, the thrust and the drag, of course, determines the, uh, the swimming speed. And so we split this uh, idea, thrust, drag, drag, into a very simple model where we can look at the propulsor essentially in isolation. And furthermore, because it's both, um, these usually a, a high aspect ratio caudal fins, um, we can think of it as almost like a, a, well, at least to begin with as a two dimensional model, um, where it is a combination of pitching and heaving motion. And so we take that piece and look at it in isolation as a thruster uh, that then when combined with the body determines the, the swimming speed of the body and the efficiency and so on. So um, we're looking for simple scaling laws. You know, how can we understand this propulsion? How can we optimize it? How can we uh, uh, design better vehicles? So it's good to have simple models and we look at these scaling laws. And the scaling laws are really uh, focusing on the um, performance in terms of its thrust and power coefficient 
and then the efficiency, the ratio of the thrust to the power coefficient. And hopefully that will allow us to scale things up and to, to, to do different things uh, to help the design of the vehicles. Um, the imported inputs to the system, uh, the, the non-dimensional frequency, which is either uh, given as the Struhl number, which is based on the um, amplitude of the caudal fin motion, the trailing edge of the caudal fin, uh, and, or the reduced frequency, which is based, uh, the, the length scale there is the chord of the caudal fin. And then uh, we define a parameter A star sometimes, which is the ratio of those two, of the uh, amplitude of the caudal fin and the chord. Of course, that's not independent of those two frequencies, but so we'll use both the stool number and the reduced frequency. And that's the, the, the space we're interested in. Um, now, to get started, uh, if we just consider a, a simple foil, two-dimensional, in sinusoidal pitching motion, um, it's interesting to look at the effects of Reynolds number. Reynolds number is often ignored in this kind of uh, uh, modeling, but it turns out to be rather important. Um, so these are the kinds of performance curves that we're gonna start looking at. We have um, the uh, thrust coefficient, we have the power coefficient, um, we have, uh, I'm sorry, it's rather hard for me to see, um, but part of my view is obscured by the, uh, the Zoom meeting panel where I can't seem to get rid of it. So never mind. a thrust coefficient, a power coefficient, and we have a drag, uh, uh, and we have a, an efficiency curve. And you can see that the thrust coefficient is uh, a function of, of Reynolds number. It increases as the Reynolds number increases. The power coefficient is not much affected by the Reynolds number. So if we look at the efficiency, we can see the rather strong dependence of the efficiency on the Reynolds number. And that's purely to do with the drag that's exerted by the caudal fin or the, 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 this pitching fin. Um, as the uh, Reynolds number increases, the drag on the fin is seen to decrease rather sharply. And as a result, the efficiency is increasing. So this is uh, something to bear in mind. The, the other thing to note about the efficiency curve is that it has a peak. As the uh, Struhl number uh, is decreasing, the efficiency goes up and then suddenly collapses. And the, the thing is that what's happening is that as the stool number gets to low values, the thrust coefficient becomes so small that the drag simply takes over. And now we have uh, very low efficiency. In fact, it goes negative, uh, which is okay in this context. It just means that the, uh, the, the, the drag is larger than the thrust. So there is a peak value. And you also know, that just for future references, that for this pitching uh, panel, this pitching airfoil, um, the uh, efficiencies, the peak efficiency is not very high. It's just over 20%. So we need to improve on that, obviously. So if we go uh, on, um, uh, we're really interested in combined pitching and heaving because uh, and you see the kind of motion that we're interested in. This is for a rigid uh, uh, panel. Um, and we're really interested in uh, phase differences between the pitching and the heaving motion of around 270 degrees. Sometimes people call that 90, but you know, in our terminology, that's 270. And you can see that this is the sort of slicing motion uh, that you would expect a fish to uh, exhibit. And indeed, that's where fish operate with this kind of um, uh, phase angle somewhere between uh, zero and two, uh, I mean, 270 and 360. So uh, one of the tools that we have is, of course, we need to check our uh, an analysis that we're doing uh, against experiment. And so we have done uh, numerous experiments in a water channel using uh, two and three dimensional uh, panels, uh, rigid and flexible, and we can measure all the forces. And if we want to, we can also, of course, look at the wake um, developed 
by this uh, pitching uh, and heaving foil. Um, not going to spend a lot of time on the wake today. I'm going to talk mostly about the performance uh, uh, exhibited by these kinds of panels. So here we see um, some results on pitching and heaving combined. Um, so that uh, what you see on the left is uh, we have a, um, uh, a fixed heave and we increase the pitch from zero to 15 degrees. This is the amplitude of the pitching. That's a theta naught in that uh, 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 expression for the motion given below. And we can see that the, uh, the thrust coefficient increases as we add pitch to the heave. And on the right, we do the same thing, but we're adding heave to a pitch and we can see the same thing. So that it's essential really to have a combined heaving and pitching motion if we're going to get reasonable efficiencies. Efficiency shown here is still not that great, but we'll, we'll, we'll do better as, as, as time goes on. And you can see uh, also here how we've defined the thrust coefficient and how we've defined the pitching coefficient, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the power coefficient, which has both the uh, heave motion, uh, h dot, the uh, velocity in the heave direction, and theta dot, which is the, of course the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the variation of the uh, pitching frequency, the pitching amplitude with time. If we, uh, uh, if we look at the efficiency curve now, um, we can see that there is a dramatic effect of this combined pitching and heaving on the efficiency. We're going from, uh, in some cases, as you know, around 10 to 15 to 20% up to 40% by adding even pitch. So we can see this is essential for efficient uh, pitching, uh, 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 efficient propulsion. Now, when we come to modeling it, we have to really think about uh, how to do this and we want a simple model. And in this simple model, uh, we uh, look at the, um, uh, the forces that cause the propulsion and the, the power. So in pitching, in general, we have three sources of, of, uh, of uh, uh, forces we, we can have uh, forces due to lift, we can add, have forces due to added mass, and of course we always have to bear in mind that there is a drag on the propulsor as well. So if we just think about pitching, we can see that the pitching motion does not contribute to time average thrust if it's by itself, right? Because the lift is always going to be uh, the force normal to the direction of motion, and so there is no component in the thrust direction, so the average thrust due to lift is zero. Um, so in this case, um, we have uh, the forces due to the component in the streamwise direction of the added mass force. So as the, uh, the, 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 the foil is pitching, it's moving fluid up and down, and as it's moving forward as well, that has a component in the streamwise direction. And so that's what's giving us the uh, acceleration, the, uh, the, the force uh, due to propulsion for a pitching airfoil. So it's just due to uh, added mass. Um, if we look at the heaving, uh, 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 the forces due that act when forces and moments due to the heaving motion, um, we have the same three sources that we have to consider, but in this case, um, the added mass does not contribute to the thrust for heaving motions because uh, that's just moving uh, in the direction normal to the direction of motion. And so that has no component in the uh, direction of motion. And so in this case, um, all the, uh, uh, the forces, um, at least in this simple model, come from the heaving motion. Uh, and it's due to lift. And as the, uh, the, the, the plate is heaving in its motion and moving forward, we have an angle of attack that's generated and that generates a lift force and that lift force has a component in the direction of motion. So it's very, 
in this simple model, it's easy to associate uh, propulsion by pitch with added mass and propulsion by heaving with uh, the fluctuating lift force. Um, and so now we can move to uh, generating some simple models and we use an added mass model, um, uh, sorry, a lift model, a fluctuating unsteady lift model from Theo Dawson uh, or Garrick. Um, Garrick is actually the one we use, but it's very similar to Theo Dawson's model. And we have an added mass model from Setoff in, in 1965. We don't use the added mass model by Theo Dawson. Setoff is more complete in a sense. So um, what that means is that we can now write down uh, some equations of motion for uh, the, uh, uh, for the uh, lift force, the lift-based forces. And we have the, uh, also the added uh, forces due to the added mass to the system. The, um, the lift forces that you can see there, if you're familiar with unsteady aerodynamics, you probably recognize some of those terms. Um, they're, they're fairly straightforward in their, uh, in their uh, derivation, uh, at least if you take a look at Theodore's and Sir Carrick's model. The added mass model uh, is, is, looks complicated, and it is. Um, and in fact, uh, it's written in the uh, coordinate system of the panel. And if you write it down in Cartesian coordinate system or fixed coordinates, then it gets even more complicated, but it turns out a lot of these forces are not going to be uh, terribly relevant to what we're doing here. And so um, it will all simplify down fairly uh, simply. So when we do all this and we neglect the small terms and we um, examine all the different terms that we end up with, uh, we end up with a, a, a fairly straightforward uh, model in some sense is um, that we have a uh, thrust coefficient here. Um, this is for all phases and amplitudes. So we've not restricted ourselves to this uh, fish-like motion. This is just for every value of the phase angle between um, heaving and pitching. And we end up with, uh, in the uh, thrust uh, model, rather simple dependence on Joule number squared. Um, plus a term which has both a contribution from the heave and the pitching, uh, that's a C2. And then there is the drag coefficient that is just simply subtracted from, uh, from the, 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 the total thrust that's being measured. Uh, the power is a little bit more complicated. Again, we see a stool number squared dependence, but then there is also reduced frequencies involved. Uh, and there are both uh, stool numbers based on heave and stool numbers based on pitch. So it's a bit more complicated there. Um, but as it turns out, that if we now can restrict ourselves to this biologically relevant uh, um, regime, where the phase angle is um, in that 90 degree sector between zero and 270, um, we have uh, that, that full model reduces to something very simple indeed, which is really rather surprising. Um, we have a thrust coefficient that is, uh, depends on the stool number squared, minus this offset due to the drag, and a power coefficient that has a bit of a mix now, but it has both um, the reduced frequency and the stool number squared in it. And then there's this uh, mixed uh, stool number H, stool number theta, which is the stool numbers based on on the heave and the pitch separately. Stool number squared is based on the combined motion. And so um, there's a little bit of subtlety there, but you can see how straightforward this model really is. Uh, how does it work? Um, well, uh, let's take a look at the next slide. Oh, uh, sorry, before we go on, we have to have a model for the drag coefficient. Um, and it turns out that uh, for this heaving and, and pitching motions in, in this sort of um, phase uh, space, uh, we have a rather simple drag coefficient. It just seems to depend upon the deflection of the, uh, of the panel itself. In other words, it's just simply based on the angle that the panel makes with the, uh, with the direction of the flow, of the incoming direction of the flow. Uh, and uh, 
so it's a very simple dependence upon theta. Um, and so it can be easily incorporated in the model. Anyway, what do we get? Well, if we look at um, the thrust, and this is for um, large amplitude motion, so I have to uh, emphasize, we're doing uh, heave motions, which are 75% of the chord, and we're doing uh, instantaneous angles of attack, uh, or sorry, in, in, in instantaneous angle of the pitching motion up to 40 degrees. Um, unfortunately, the little video won't work for me, but it, 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 it was meant to illustrate to, to show how large these amplitudes really are. So this is quite surprising. They're comparable to what um, we see in the motion of fish. And so we have the unscaled uh, thrust coefficient on the, on the left. Uh, and we can see there is an offset there that depends upon uh, the, uh, an offset due to the drag that depends upon the pitch angle or the instantaneous uh, angle of attack. And then if we uh, put it in our scaling so that we subtract the drag coefficient and we plot it as uh, stool number squared, you can see a nice linear dependence. So the model works uh, really quite well for the thrust coefficient. If we look at the uh, power coefficient, very similar, we see uh, uh, the, that the drag is not influencing the power as much, which is what we expected, and that we get this nice linear dependence when we plot it against this uh, scaling parameter um, that is given on the, on the axis there, uh, the reduced frequency times stool number squared minus this sort of mixed stool number. Again, this is large amplitude motions, very simple models for the thrust, very simple model for the power, and so what we can do is we can write down an efficiency uh, expression now um, based on those two, uh, the model for the power and the thrust. And we rewrite it a little bit uh, to use a little bit uh, better terminology, but it's the same, it's the same thing. We haven't done any, anything different here. And so we see that the efficiency depends upon this non-dimensional amplitude, A star, it depends on the stool number squared, depends on the drag term, it depends on the stool number cubed on the bottom, and then this sort of uh, one minus this mixed um, uh, stool number essentially between the heave and the pitch. So let's take a look at those individual contributions and see what happens. Um, if we look at, at first at the stool number dependence, we see that it's stool number squared on the top, stool number cubed on the bottom. So if we didn't have the drag term, which is this A1 theta naught. Remember, it just depends upon the angle or the, the maximum angle that the uh, panel makes in pitch. Uh, then we would simply have, as the stool number gets to very small values, the efficiency would go to infinity. But of course, that doesn't happen because at some point the, uh, the drag coefficient has to take over uh, uh, because at very low stool numbers, we're gonna get very little thrust. So the drag's going to dominate and that brings that curve down, right? So it's just a balance between um, the flapping and the drag. And we can see that uh, we now have a peak in the efficiency at a given stool number. And if we do compare it to some, uh, uh, some data, uh, taken from Dan Quinn's work, it's a heaving and pitching uh, 0012 aerofoil. Um, we can see that that expression um, that I just showed you fits this data like a glove. Um, there's only one disposable constant, which is just to, to raise it up and down the amplitude because that's something you need to find by experiment. But then if we change the, um, the uh, you know, so you can see that we, it defines this peak in the in the uh, uh, thrust coefficient uh, in the efficiency for uh, changing stool number that we've seen before. Um, and as we decrease the drag, we would see this uh, efficiency increase. Uh, again, uh, not unexpected, uh, and uh, and then this sudden drop off as uh, we run out of thrust at very low uh, stool number. So the other thing that we can uh, note, infer from this, is that um, we can see the peak as the drag decreases, which is really the Reynolds number increasing. As we go to the left here, 
the peak in the in the efficiency curve also shifts to lower stool numbers. And that's something that we see in biology. Um, this is a compendium of uh, aquatic locomotion over a huge Reynolds number range and the best data that's available on the stool number. Um, and you, so, so you can see that um, at high Reynolds numbers, um, we would expect the stool number to be low and it sort of averages out at 0.3 for um, um, a lot of these um, swimmers. And at low Reynolds numbers, we would expect the stool number to be larger because we're moving to the right on our uh, stool number curve. And that's exactly what you see um, for these lower uh, Reynolds number swimmers. So it's all in accordance, at least, at least this part of it is with the biology. Um, now, um, what about the amplitude? Uh, remember we had uh, the amplitude A star, this uh, non-dimensional amplitude of the trailing edge motion compared to the chord length of the, of the fin. And um, it looks like you could just improve the efficiency without limit by increasing the amplitude. And of course, that's not gonna happen. Um, at some point, the amplitude of the motion uh, will become so large uh, that we, uh, dynamics tool becomes important. Um, even in our large amplitude motions, we were able to avoid dynamic stall by combining the pitching and the heaving so that the instantaneous angle of attack is small enough, but at some point, increasing amplitude will also cause dynamic stall, and that's going to um, basically destroy the model, but it also explains why you can't just in keep increasing the amplitude to get more uh, efficient motion. However, there is a subtle point here um, which we've made elsewhere, and I won't, I won't uh, sh show much evidence here, but it turns out that if you want to have high efficiency motion, it's, one way to put that is that you want big and slow. You want large amplitude motions, but you want it to do it relatively slow so that um, you can avoid this um, uh, dynamic stall and take advantage of the stall number dependence. So um, you can either go quick and fast or large and small, and large and small turns out to be more efficient. Um, uh, uh, what about the motion composition? Remember we had that other term in there, this um, one minus H star, uh, theta star, and it turns out that um, that highlighted term is minimized in other words, it gives you a maximum efficiency when the heave and pitch uh, make a comparable contribution uh, to the motion. Um, but it turns out that that's actually not the best place to be because uh, remember that the, the pitching amplitude is tied to the drag. And so it's likely that you want to, uh, you want to find the right balance between heaving and pitching to minimize the drag and still take advantage of this um, of this uh, one minus H star theta star term. So we have a simple model. It's given us um, uh, very good results on, on thrust and drag on a two dimensional uh, rigid foil. Um, and we uh, can say something about efficiency, right? Big and slow. Uh, we want the stool number is gonna depend on the Reynolds number. All these things come directly from this model. Um, we can compare a little bit of that with the uh, biology. Uh, when we uh, look at the um, amplitude of the motion of the trailing edge of, this is uh, for a bunch of uh, uh, dolphins. Um, the, uh, and the data is from war and fish. Um, we can see that there's a sort of linear dependence between the amplitude and the speed of uh, the animal. Um, within the scatter. And so um, what we can do is, is um, by comparing, uh, what does the model say about this? And the model says that um, es essentially that uh, if you want to stay on the peak of the efficiency curve, you have to keep your stool number constant. And so as you change speed, 
you increase the frequency of your oscillation so that to keep the stool number constant. And this is essentially what this, uh, what this result is saying. Animals tend to swim at the same stool number regardless of the speed. So, so if they want to go faster, they just increase the amplitude and that increases the speed, but they do it in such a way to keep the stool number constant. They're very clever, these animals. Oh, sorry. Um, I want to talk a little bit about flexible propulsors, and that's sort of a segue into the uh, the, the the latter part of this talk. Um, you know, it's clear that animals exploit flexibility to improve their efficiency and 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 their performance in general. Um, not so much for tuna. Tuna have fairly stiff uh, caudal fins, but other animals don't. Uh, and so, it's interesting to see what happens when you uh, introduce flexibility. So here we have this sort of effective panel stiffness, uh, which will, uh, uh, which we can change by changing the uh, properties of the panel itself. So here we have the stiff uh, result um, showing the thrust coefficient versus the uh, stool number. Um, and you can see this classic stool number squared dependence. Um, and then what happens when we change the stiffness? So we're going to reduce the stiffness and we can see that the, the thrust coefficient is going up. This is good news, right? Uh, and then we increase the, the de decrease the stiffness some more and suddenly we've lost some uh, thrust. And you can imagine the panel is simply too soft to um, effectively push fluid around. And as you increase the uh, decrease the stiffness more and more, you decrease the thrust coefficient as well. Now, what does that mean in terms of fish? Well, the fish are probably somewhere between the red and the blue. Uh, if I'm, you know, it's a, it's a good guess by George Lauder. Um, uh, probably wouldn't stand up in court, but it, because it's very hard to measure the flexibility of fish. You know, if you pick up a live fish, they instantaneously uh, you know, their muscles go rigid and so you can't measure the stiffness. And if you have a dead fish, um, you're obviously not taking in, uh, any account of the muscle action itself. So it's very hard to measure the stiffness of a fish or the coral fin or anything like that. Um, but this, this certainly suggests that there is a kind of optimum stiffness for maximum thrust. Um, what about the efficiency? Uh, this is the sort of curve for all the uh, phase differences and amplitudes of the heaving and the pitch and so on. And you can see this, uh, this, this, this is massive black dots for the stiff uh, case. And if we do um, flexibility, it's interesting to see what happens on the low stool number end, not much is happening, but on the higher stool number end, you can see an increase in the efficiency. And here we can see it even, even more, right? And then we kind of reach a limit with these green dots and going to uh, a very uh, 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 flexible propulsor is not gonna help you anymore. So what flexibility seems to do is it helps out a little bit on the low stool number end, but it seems to help out a lot at the highest stool number end where you can improve the efficiency quite dramatically by uh, adapting your flexibility. There's a kind of Pareto front that seems to appear in this, in this work, which is the limit where you can't seem to get any more by changing this particular parameter. So um, that's all very interesting. Um, in the last part of this talk, I wanna talk a little bit about manta rays um, and where flexibility comes into that. And um, this is obviously um, a very different animal from uh, tuna and they uh, propel themselves by their large enlarged pectoral fins in a flapping motion but they also actually have um, this heaving and pitching combined it's just that the uh, the uh, wavelength of the undulation is much larger than the pectoral fin cord so it's a bit harder to see that but that's how they swim is uh, combined pitching and heaving motion. And one of the ways that we've looked at this is in the lab is to uh, build a robotic uh, manta ray, or at least a fin of the manta ray. 
And uh, this has been a really interesting exercise. It, 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 it spanned over a number of years, but um, I think that we've, uh, we've really benefited by trying to build a robot and understanding how actual animals swim. And so we can look at the forces and the moments on this. We can look at the wake flow. Um, how do we build this robotic fin? Um, well, uh, we go to the lab and we build this sort of Rube Goldberg device, this mechanical actuator. This is uh, Rick Clark doing that. Uh, and you can see that it actually mimics the motion of a manta ray to, the, to, to, to quite a nice extent. Uh, you can see it in the bottom frame looking uh, along the span and you can see that this uh, seems to combine at least the basic elements of what, uh, how um, these uh, uh, manta rays and cow nose rays uh, propel themselves. And there are again two, two parameters that are interested in the stool number based on the trailing edge motion and we have this um, um, the, how the wavelength of the actuation for the undulation uh, compares to the chord length itself. And for uh, manta rays, that's going to be greater than one. And here we have uh, some results on the efficiency for um, uh, lambda of four. So the wavelength is, is four times the chord length. And we see that the efficiency curve actually has two peaks to it. Uh, one at about a stool number of 0.2 and one at about a stool number of 0.3. And when we look at the wake of that, um, uh, one of them is sort of identified as, as, as 2S, which is where uh, two uh, single trailing edge vortices are shed during a shedding cycle. And then the other one, which is more like a 2P wake, which is where two pairs of vortices are uh, shed per shedding cycle. And they typically have a widely diverging wake uh, rather than a narrow wake. And yet, when we look at these results, we see that the efficiency of the 2P is very similar to the 2S mode. So it's possible to operate in two different flapping regimes, two different stool numbers, and still have a comparable efficiency. Um, and for this uh, particular lambda, uh, the efficiency is whatever it is. For lambda of six, we actually get an optimal efficiency of 55%. And this is for the, our rather crude model in the, in the water tank. So this is really quite encouraging. Um, but these peaks are interesting, right? Uh, so uh, kind of where, the, where do they come from? And where, how does flexibility play a role in this? So we went back and did some very basic work. This was with uh, Dan Quinn and, and George Lauder. Uh, and um, we uh, looked at, again, stripping the problem down, making very simple models. This is a flexible propulsion, flexible panel. It's in this motion, it's just heaving at the uh, leading edge. Uh, but as that initiates the motion, there is an angle of attack. There is an input uh, amplitude A, there's an output amplitude A prime at the trailing edge, which can be quite different from what's input at the, at the, at the leading edge. There is a chord length, um, and of course, a whole bunch of non-dimensional parameters. Um, and one of them is this effective flexibility, which is really a reduced frequency based on the, um, on the um, uh, resonant modes of the system, where the density in this one is the density of the fluid. This would normally appear in a sort of Euler-Bernoulli equation with the density of, the, of the, the membrane. But when you put the membrane in water, it's the mass of the water that dominates over the mass of the membrane. And so this turns out to be a good non-dimensional parameter uh, for looking at this uh, non-dimensional frequency. We obviously have a stool number. We have a, um, the non-dimensional amplitude of the motion uh, uh, input A compared to C, the chord length, we have the angle of attack, and we have, of course, a phase difference between heaving and pitching. So we can do pitching motions alone, we can do heaving motions, or we can do them together. 
we have this phase angle show up again. And so, um, so, so this is what it looks like in the lab. Um, this is for the most flexible uh, case. You can see this sort of undulatory motion that's being produced. Here, the wavelength is, is shorter than the length of the, uh, of the, of the membrane, the cord length. Um, but we can, of course, vary that depending on the frequency. Um, we can measure the forces, we can measure the power, we can measure the efficiency, and so um, what's happening. Here is what we get if we map out the, uh, the uh, efficiency curve in both the non-dimensional frequency space and the Struhl number space uh, for a particular amplitude of motion input. And this is for heave only. And so what we get, we get, we see a, um, a, a bimodal uh, uh, distribution. If we fixed the, the uh, non-dimensional frequency, uh, the, 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 the effective flexibility, that term, and we change the stool number independently, then we just get a curve that looks like the ones we had before. You know, we have um, a, a peak in the efficiency curve and it tails off slowly for increasing stool number. Uh, but that now occurs at two different values of this uh, uh, omega uh, a star, uh, which both occur at this Reynolds number, in this case of about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, something like that. And the efficiencies, are, again, not very high, you know, 20%. But we do see this bimodal approach again. And again, when we look at the wakes, we can kind of identify one for 2s and one for 2p. So the efficiency is not very high, as I said, okay. But if we now go to um, uh, combined heaving and pitching motions, um, of course the landscape becomes very complex because we have five parameters, the flexural frequency, the struggle number, the heave amplitude, the chord ratio, we have the maximum pitch angle and then heave the pitch angle uh, phase difference. So this is a massive optimization problem if we're looking for optimum in terms of the efficiency. And so um, uh, Dan Quinn was very clever and he um, basically uh, used a hill climbing method in the experiment as it was running. So you could run through thousands of parameters and you just look at gradients and look for the local optimum until you find it. Uh, and then uh, what we find is that when we have heave and pitch and flexibility, the efficiency is now increasing from 22 to 38%. And um, the uh, again, there's a bimodal uh, case. There, there are two places where you can find very similar efficiencies, um, uh, and yet they're, they're operating at different uh, flexural frequencies. And that's very similar to the behavior that we saw in the manta ray, of course. So we're kind of getting a feeling for how this uh, works. Clearly, there are some sort of resonant uh, 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 places in this operating space where we get these highly efficient uh, motions. So, um, so here's a summary. You know, we've done um, uh, uh, a lot of work looking, modeling very simple things. Um, that have some seem to have some relevance to biology. Um, our models are limited. Um, they don't explain everything, but I think they've given us some great insight into how to improve performance, both how to improve thrust and efficiency. And that's really the space we're operating in. We want the highest thrust for the best efficiency. And depending on what purpose you want to use the uh, underwater vehicle for, um, it's certainly true that pitch and heave have to be combined. Perfectly true that you have to work in a certain phase space. Um, and there's still lots of questions left, right? There's, I mean, all sorts of things happen. You look at that animal, it's a very complicated animal. There are multiple fins on a tuna. Um, there are these little finlets that appear on the, uh, on the, the tail itself, those little ridges that you see um, on, the, on, the, on the way towards the caudal fin. They're remarkable. Um, 
they are individually controlled by the animal. They each have their own muscle group um, and they can individually control the angle on those finlets or they can collapse them. Um, so clearly they have a, a flow control uh, uh, aspect to them. And there are some people at Virginia, uh, uh, in the University of Virginia who are looking at this in, in great detail, also with George Lauder. Um, there is uh, uh, both, uh, you know, a ventral and a caudal fin, uh, a dorsal fin. The dorsal fin and the, and, and the, uh, the, the pectoral fins can both collapse, or at least the, 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 the one on the top, the, um, uh, the dorsal fin, can actually fold into a little pocket inside the tuna. Um, the pectoral fin on the side has a little indentation in the body, and that can be collapsed in, into the body. So tuna are a remarkable animal. Uh, they're built for speed, and we've only touched on a little bit of what they can do in terms of thrust and performance. And I think that going forward, there's lots of opportunity for um, improvement. Now, I want to, uh, two more slides, I think. I want to just show you this. Um, where are we with what we've done so far? You know, we know we're nowhere near a tuna yet because, you, you know, or a dolphin, you can see that there are kind of efficiencies as best we can estimate are up in the 80 to 90% uh, uh, levels. Plotting efficiency versus thrust. You know, we've seen what happens when we have just pitch and you just heave. You don't get a lot of efficiency. Uh, you can get enough thrust if you just flap fast enough. Um, but if you combine pitch and heave, your efficiency curve gets much better. Uh, and then uh, when you uh, optimize the foil shape, which is, you know, effectively reducing the drag on the foil, you, that improves your performance. Uh, when you have flexibility, that improves your performance. Uh, and this is our projection for, you know, uh, simple heaving and pitching foils. Um, and then, of course, as you increase the Reynolds number, uh, if you're operating in, in, the, in the ocean with a larger uh, vehicle, that also improves performance because, again, it's reducing your drag. So you might get to something that looks like a propeller, uh, which is an interesting place to be, right? You've now got something that doesn't make a lot of noise, uh, and yet it's it, the performance is comparable. And depending on the mission, you can choose where you want to operate. So this is all very encouraging. So um, that's kind of my summary of where we are. And uh, there are lots of room for improvement, as I said. And um, so we look forward to, uh, to doing some of that work in the future. Now, here is, there's a question that's left. And the question is, do we make underwater vehicles that look like fish or do we make underwater vehicles that don't look like fish? And I think there's a case to be made for both. Here you can see this Antibot demonstrator from uh, University of Virginia. That's Hillary Bart Smith uh, lab. And you can see it really performs very well. And it, it has a, a nice um, efficiency and thrust performance. And it, but it's looking like a fish. Um, we found recently that in fact, if you looked at a tuna bot um, and you do a caudal fin based on the tuna, if you replace it with a rectangular caudal fin, it actually improves its performance. So I think there's room for biomimetic or bio-inspired underwater vehicles, in addition to the ones that look like uh, uh, animals like this one. So bio-inspired UAVs may outperform biomimetic UAVs. That's the, the takeaway here. Um, I want to thank you for your attention, um, and I wanted to put out a plug for uh, for this uh, because this afternoon um, the uh, this rover is going to be landing on Mars, and uh, I will be glued to my television to see what's going to happen. I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it's going to uh, make it through this uh, seven minutes of terror, and I'm sure that. Um, uh, in some ways, that will be much more interesting than the talk that I've just given now. But I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thanks again for, for the talk. It was actually very inspiring. 
and uh, so the stage is open for questions. So whoever wants to to ask a question, you can just uh, write in the chat or open your mic and ask yourself. Uh, please feel free. Hi, this is Luis from Brazil. Yeah. Thanks for, hi, thanks for this excellent talk. Let me ask you a stupid question. Uh, we know that, that there's a big difference between motion in low Reynolds number and high Reynolds number. Yeah. And uh, flying animals and uh, swimming animals, I assume that they both swim at very, very high, uh, move at very high Reynolds number. Oh, it, no, you, you know, the Reynolds number is all over the map. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, but it's higher. Huh? Um, depends. Um, insects fly at quite low Reynolds numbers. Oh, no, we're talking about uh, birds and uh, oh, birds, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah and but, why we don't see like a, a proportion like tail, uh, as you see, uh, in water, tail proportion and the ray proportion, like uh, animals, yeah. and in, in air, you don't see it's just not a, not a matter of Reynolds number only. No, no, no. I, I, I think the primary difference is that, you know, a flying animal has to support its own weight. Uh, and, and, and to do that, you have to generate some lift. You know, even if you're, even if you're gliding, you have to produce some lift. Um, and uh, a, a fish is almost neutrally buoyant, so that there's no need to support the weight. Um, and so all you're worried about is, you know, going forward, uh, and so uh, you can you, your your propulsive um, uh, surface can of course be oriented, you know, vertical or horizontal. It doesn't matter, right? I mean, dolphins use the horizontal plane, and fish mostly use the the vertical plane. Um, but all they're concerned about is producing forward motion. They don't have to support their weight as well. So I, I think that's probably the primary difference between the two. Not the, it's not the Reynolds number. I don't think so, no, because the Reynolds numbers are on, on, on birds are, are, are fairly high, as you say, and on most fish, anything over about 10 or 20 centimeters, the Reynolds numbers are, you know, in the sort of range that I was talking about. Okay. Reynolds number effects are always important because, you know, they dictate the drag, but it, it's not going to change the, the mode of, of, uh, of propulsion. I have a question, Lex. Yeah, Jean-Paul. You speak about maneuverability. I think yeah. that for the manta ray is uh, quite obvious, but for tuna is another story probably, no? Yeah, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it depends on how you want to measure uh, maneuverability. Um, clearly, uh, you know, manta rays can display some extraordinary behaviors. They they uh, they have this sort of feeding um, mode where they essentially do barrel rolls. You know, they they just they just go they, you know they they go forward and they they roll and they and they just sort of um, feed on this local density of whatever they're feeding on um, krill. Um, so yes, they're very highly maneuverable. They, they can also um, be precise in their uh, uh, approach to something. You know, they can maneuver themselves in currents to get to a very specific location. Um, tuna don't quite do that, um, but again, they're very highly maneuverable. When they're when they're in a in a school like this and they're startled, they will turn on a dime. They just you know they have this sort of C start motion. Which where they flex their bodies more than they usually do, and they can propel themselves into a completely different direction. So they can they use maneuverability to escape predators. Not so much in their feeding motions or in their uh, you know in their which what manta rays do. So I don't know if that's answered your question, but you know it's how do you measure maneuverability? <laughs> Hey, Lex. Yeah. Hey, Jim. Hey, how are you? Uh, I have a question. 
All right, this is fundamental. So one of the big differences between fish motion and say aircraft and so on uh, is that non-steady effects are much more important for fish motion than they are for, for aircraft. They're flapping uh, in order to create propulsion and so on. When we learn fluid dynamics, when we teach fluid dynamics, uh, we tend to emphasize steady flow because it's much easier to understand uh, and you don't have to deal with uh, part of the inertial uh, force. But in the case of fish motion, that's not the case. So to what extent did you have to sort of ad address the physics associated with non-steadiness, inertial effects, having to move masses of, of liquid that are fairly dense uh, yeah. out of the way, so there's inertia in the fluid. How, how, to what extent was that important in understanding uh, you know, fish propulsion? Oh, the, the added mass term is, is, is fundamental. You know, it it is it is uh, yeah. You can you can you can't address uh, swimming without uh, addressing the added mass problem. Uh, so, so that being the case, if you compare propulsion with fish, you you know where this is bio inspired and all that, right? right. So how do we translate this sort of emphasis on non steadiness for propulsion in marine animals to? Uh, improving our own propulsive systems, which are designed around steady state. Yeah, well, I think that for underwater vehicle, any vehicle that doesn't have a human being on board could take advantage of unsteady motion. You know, you can't have passengers sitting on an airline, you know, that's that's going, you know, doing that, right? That's not going to work. Um, uh, the meal service would be a mess. Uh, but you know, if if you're talking about a, 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 a you know unmanned aerial vehicles, um, lots of them, uh, you know, there was a huge exploration of uh, flapping aerial vehicles. You know, again, imitating bird motion using unsteadiness uh, as part of their propulsive uh, behavior. And for underwater vehicles, that's you know that's primary issue is this unsteadiness. Yeah. So could you make a case that there are some physics that you can take advantage of in the unsteadiness to improve efficiency? I, if it, it depends on how you generate the propulsive motion. You know, if you have an engine on board, that's one thing, right? Um, if you have, want to do a propeller, I would think that there's at least some argument to be made for having flexible propellers and for having propellers that uh, change their uh, uh, angle of attack as they rotate. You know, so this kind of, um, see, people have thought about that. It usually turns out that it's, you know, when you actually want to build a propeller like that, it's way too complicated and it just falls apart and it's not that much better than propellers anyway. And so, you know, uh, some of these ideas don't necessarily give you an advantage. Well, actually, now that you mention it, wind turbines currently operate by uh, adjusting the pitch in order to change the local angle of attack and maximize thrust. So there's an example for you. Yeah, they, they don't usually do it on a, you know, uh, on, on a, uh, within one rotation, you know. Oh, they do it on every rotation. Modern wind turbines adjust the pitch according to the shear profile. Uh, to take advantage of or, or to uh, adjust for the shear profile. So they're actually done every rotation. These are the most modern turbines I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, you see, so, yeah, absolutely. Good. Excellent. Nice talk. Thank you. So we have one more question. Do, uh, so uh, the, the question is written in the chat. So how much activity adds to the better efficiency? I'm sorry, what? Uh, how the flexibility adds to the better efficiency? That's, that's the, the question. Ah, yes. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question. Um, and I think to understand that you really do have to look at the flow that's generated by the flexible uh, panel. And uh, what you can see is that um, this, you know, you have uh, vortices being generated at the leading edge, and then they travel, in, at least in this heaving and pitching motion, they travel along the flexible foil, and then they're shed from the trailing edge. And it's sort of, you know, it's, it's the interaction of those uh, leading edge vortices 
with the, with the, uh, the shape of the membrane at any given time and uh, the timing, you know, they have to arrive at the trailing edge in a given, at a given phase angle. And so um, it's, it's the interaction between the shape of the airfoil, the instantaneous shape of the airfoil and the actual flow patterns that are being generated uh, at the leading edge. And if you do it right, you get a, a high efficiency. If you get it wrong, you lose efficiency. You know, so it's, it's, it's like the kick that you get from the trailing edge motion depends a lot on the phase of the flow that, uh, that's coming into that trailing edge. Um, we have another question in the, uh, in the chat that's uh, asking, so uh, someone is asking, uh, do you think that uh, aspect ratio and sweep angle enhance the performance even more? Aspect ratio definitely does. Yes, uh, I mean, there's, there's, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's reasonably obvious, right? It, why aspect ratio would be, uh, uh, would be a, an important parameter. Now, aspect ratios beyond about three or four or five are actually, uh, you know, you don't get a lot of extra benefit to it. But as you go from an aspect ratio of one to about three or four, um, you really see that difference. And it's simply because, you know, the flow is more two dimensional, the wake is more confined, you get a better bang for your buck. Um, the other one was um, aspect, oh, sweep angle. Sweep angle. Ah, I, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, on an aircraft, you have sweep. Why do you have sweep? Well, you, you have it because basically you're flying transonically and you're trying to delay the drag crisis by, you know, um, you, you change the effective Mach number coming in by using sweep. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't use sweep at all. Um, you know, uh, um, an airfoil with zero sweep has a better performance than one that has with sweep, um, except for this drag crisis in transonic flow. So what, why do fish have sweep angles? I have no idea. And... Um, I don't understand it because, as a, you know, I, I mentioned it briefly. We have a little uh, uh, robo tuna, you know, that we can put in the water channel. We can make it flap like a tuna. It's it's again we borrowed it from uh, from UVA, um, and so we can change the pec the caudal fin. And when we have a caudal fin that looks like a tuna, we get you know one uh, swim speed. And when we replace it with the, the same area caudal fin with the same aspect ratio, but it, uh, it's a two-dimensional one, you know, so it has no sweep, we can swim faster. So I'm at a loss. <laughs> um, so um, there, is, there is another question also uh, related to the flexibility. Um, do you think flexibility can reduce the drag coefficient and what's the influence on the slip velocity? Uh, slip velocity? Uh, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I, I know what the, that means, but um, yes, you can change the drag coefficient, absolutely, with, with the flexibility. Um, but, you know, it, it, you can actually increase the drag as well um, because what happens is that, for example, if you have a flexible membrane and, um, you know, and it, think of it as a really highly flexible membrane, so it has multiple wavelengths. Um, and if the amplitude of that, uh, those wavelengths gets to a certain uh, uh, size, you can have separation of the back. And as soon as you get that, uh, the drag coefficient will skyrocket and your efficiency will, 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 will plummet. So, um, you know, yes, definitely you can have too much flexibility and then your performance goes out at the window. Um, so there's always, you know, this, this, this optimization problem where you're trying to balance the efficiency that you're getting to the thrust you're getting and depending where you are, Flexibility can help you or, or it can uh, work against you.
Okay. Um, I do have a question myself. Uh, so, uh, uh, in uh, in the model which you you used for the for the motion, you always have uh, uh, this kind of uh, same harmonics between uh, used for for the two 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 sorts of uh, motions you 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 impose, uh, and you basically have a phase shift between them. Yeah. Um, so, uh, would it bring any advantage to change to to use super harmonics for one of the two uh, motions? Do, do you think uh, that might uh, play a role? Or yeah, no, def definitely. Um, there's been a little bit of work on that. Um, you know, the, the trouble is because you open up another parameter space. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's been some work on on relatively minor. Uh, uh, you know, so that you're introducing a harmonic that has maybe, you know, 10% of the amplitude mm -hmm. of the primary. And yes, you can, you can make a difference. You can change the efficiency. Uh, it, it, it usually, it's got to be always a little careful, you know, um, because when your efficiency is close to zero, you can double it and you still have zero. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to be a little careful about that. But yes, people have seen improvements by using uh, super harmonics. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's, uh, uh, well, that's, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Definitely the parameter space is huge. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's lots of room here. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, um, Let's see if uh, there are other questions. Uh, is there someone else who wants to, to, to ask a question? Uh, so I don't see anyone in the, in the chat. So if there is someone who, who, can, uh, who wants to ask questions, they, you can just uh, unmute your, your, your mic and uh, ask directly. Uh, well, uh, this does not seem to... Yeah, well, you know, in, in any case, if, if people think of something later, just, you know, uh, email me or whatever. It's, you know, I'll be happy to try to answer some, some questions offline if that's, if that's the way it is. It's not a problem. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah. I stop, stop sharing, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I would say, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you, Lex, for this very interesting uh, uh, presentation, for replying to, to the numerous questions you had. And uh, I, I truly believe it was a very inspiring talk, as I said before, and uh, you saw it also coming out from a, a very uh, lively discussion. So thanks again for, uh, for, thank uh, for this webinar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good evening and uh, I hope to see you all uh, uh, next week for, for, the, for the webinar of uh, Lab. Thanks a lot and have a good evening uh, to everyone and uh, good day to you, Lance. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.